All right, I have another video for you, Jesus in India. So this is a review of the movie, actually titled Jesus in India, produced by Mr. Ralph Davids. And um, in the video, you see a man by the name of Ed Martin. He's um, going on travels, trying to find proof of Jesus actually being in India. So if you hadn't watched my previous video, Jesus in India, The Lost and the Missing Years, uh, I'd suggest you watch that because um, it has a lot more uh, information about the subject. And I'll be pulling from that video some information uh, into this one. You can find it on my YouTube channel, Eternal Perspectives. So I'm just going to be making comments from some things and statements made in this video that I watched. So around the uh, five and a half minute mark, Ed Martin says that the file on Jesus is full of unanswered questions, basically the file of his life. He says that there's no record made of his existence during his life, and if one was made, it didn't survive. But really, this is an unusual, because there's a, a lot of people in history, there were no records made of their existence during their lifetime. It may have come afterwards, but at least for Jesus, we do have uh, accounts of the New Testament Gospels, which were written not too long after Jesus lived from either eyewitnesses or those who um, knew or uh, uh, got information from eyewitnesses. And we also have the writings of Paul the Apostle, who had experienced uh, Jesus on the road to D Damascus. And somehow that experience changed him from one of the most ardent haters of the Christians to a follower that... Uh, it's pretty amazing. Mr. Martin also says that nothing he, Jesus, may have written actually survived, but again, this is, I think, true for most or a number of historical figures from that time period. And let's see what the, the agnostic New Testament scholar Bart Ehrman says about Jesus and his existence. And maybe this is a po uh, from a podcast, he's talking with an atheist uh, about the existence of Jesus. I mean, so, right. I mean, there are people so, who want to know what Jesus really did say. Right. And, um, you know, that, that assumes that he really existed. Yeah, and, 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 but, and that we can't know. You have to look at the evidence. What, 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 and, and what is the evidence? Because even that we cannot know for sure. But I guess you would say, look at, look at, we can look at the earliest manuscripts that date to what, around when he should have been, existed or something, or what? What do we have? Because we don't have anything that exists, right, until after he died, allegedly, right? About him, you mean? Right, about Jesus. Well, that's true of everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, well, not really. I, I, just saw, I, I thought there was some, well, I guess so, but I thought that there are some contemporary, that, 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 that there are some writers who write about people as they existed, like with Jesus Caesar, weren't right, there? But, but you, we, don't have, I mean, we don't have anybody from that time talking to us now. All we have are ancient records. Right, but yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm, okay. All we have for Jesus are ancient records. But we don't have any ancient records of anyone who wrote about Jesus while he was alive, do we? No, absolutely okay. not. And, we and don't that's have, the difference. Just as we don't have for billions of people who lived in the past that we're pretty sure existed. I mean, just, I mean, we have more evidence for Jesus than we have for almost anybody from his time period. We have more evidence for Jesus than for almost anybody from his time period. So, I mean, you know, I'm not saying this as a believer. I'm not a believer. But as a historian, I'm just saying that you, that you, you can't just kind of dismiss it and say, well, you know, we don't know. I mean, you have to look at the evidence. Yeah, I think that's key. You have to look at the evidence, and as Mr. Ehrman stated there, he's not a believer, so he has uh, nothing to try to prove all this evidence for Jesus. Uh, Mr. Martin goes on to talk about in the video, well, we have a few details about Jesus' about Jesus's childhood and family, no record of any kind about where he was or what he was doing from the age of 12 to 30. In the video, he said he asked his Bible teachers about this, and they basically just said, well, God does not want us to know about that. So it's a shame they couldn't uh, answer his questions and maybe that would have sent him down a different path. But really there's no reason to have recorded every detail of Jesus' life, you know, from his um, birth through uh, his adolescent teen years because the main purpose he came was uh, really from the start of his ministry. So uh, there was no... Uh, urgent or burning reason to have recorded every detail of his life during these missing years. And Martin said that he lost a number of friends, sold his house to have his book published. He even said, I guess this caused some problems with his family as well because they didn't believe him. And then he 
it seems like he tries to um, equate himself with Jesus from the aspect that he said that, well, you know, he was rejected by friends and family, and Jesus was also rejected. And then he goes on to make this statement that, I think the rejection does not deal so much with the individual being rejected, Ed Martin or Jesus, but it deals more with the rejector, or the people rejecting them. That seems like a fairly unfair statement, because if you had uh, proof of what you're believing, then I'm sure people would uh, look at it and they could weigh the evidence, but for Jesus being in India, they're scant and Really, the evidence just is not there, so you can't fault the people for not believing what he's saying. But then, ironically, at the end of the video, Ed Martin says this, well, We have come away with no closer proof that Jesus was in India. Hmm. So he went to travel there, trying to find some evidence, but as he said, there's come away with no closer proof than when he started. Uh, how can you really fault other people for not believing it as well? In around 17 minutes, they interview Brother Chidananda of the Self-Realization Fellowship. He talks about uh, the Magi from the East visiting Jesus after he's born, and that Paramahansa Yogananda, who's the founder of the Self-Realization Fellowship, says that, well, these Magi were actually great rishis who had traveled from India. Hmm. I wonder how Padmahansa Yogananda knows that. If you read other uh, sources on this, some will say these Magi were, were actually from Persia. And in the video, uh, they talk to a professor who says, "Well, we cannot, we can't know where these Magi came from." So here we have two people in the same video, basically contradicting each other. And at the 25-minute mark, Ed Martin talks about Nicholas Notovich, so it would be helpful to watch my previous video where I actually go in more detail about him. But he's the um, first person who had written about or came across this uh, Tibetan manuscript at the Hemis Monastery that supposedly spoke of Jesus. So he was able to uh, see, it, see it and copy portions of it and then translate it into a notebook that he had with him, and he eventually wrote a book about it. But uh, while he was trekking in Tibet, or Ladakh, this northern part of India, he had visited the Hemis Monastery. Uh, the first time, asked the head lama there about uh, if he could see this manuscript about Jesus. The head lama looked for it, couldn't find it, told him to come back later. So he left, but as he was leaving, uh, some distance later, his horse stumbled, he was thrown and fell from his horse and ended up breaking his leg and returning to, back to the Hemis Monastery. Then as fate would have it, luckily, somehow, the head lama was able to find two manuscripts that talked about Isa, showed them to Nicholas Notovich, and then he recorded them in his notebook. But Ed Martin says that Nicholas Notovich stayed at the Hemis Monastery recuperating for a number of weeks after he had fallen from his horse. But if you read the other sources that talk about this same event, say Nicholas Notovich himself. I was able to attain three editions of his book. He said he was at Hemis for two to three days, and one version said a few days, and I believe this is because his initial book was written in French, and so it was translated from French into English, and one translation translated as a few days, and the other two said two to three days, but either way, they're a short period of time. We read other sources on the subject. Swami Abedananda said he was there for six weeks. A man named Paul Van Oyen said he was there for some time. Trisha McCannon said she was there for many months. As Ed Martin said he was there for a number of weeks or some weeks. And Carol Lamb said he was there until he was able to walk again. But if you read Nicholas Notovich's book, his own account of it, that he was able to arrange some porters with a litter. And so he was actually carried out of Hemis Monastery on a litter after two to three days. So he wasn't there until he was able to walk. So this calls into question that people are writing books on this subject. People read them thinking that they're authorities, but they get detail like this wrong that's easy to verify. What else in their books may not be true? 
Later on, Ed Martin then says that in, in addition to Nicholas Notovich, there were so many other witnesses in later years who also saw the same document, The Life of St. Isa. And so here's a picture of the book Nicholas Notovich wrote, The Unknown Life of Jesus Christ. And from my research, I've really only been able to confirm two people who actually said they have seen the manuscript and then translated it. One was Nicholas Notovich, a picture of him here, and the other one was Swami Abedananda, who wrote about it in his book, Swami Abedananda's Journey to Kashmir and Tibet. You'll hear about a third Russian man by the name of Nicholas Rorich, who said to have seen the, the manuscript while he traveled there. But in all of his books, I could never find that he actually made a statement that he saw this Isa manuscript. You know, but he did have uh, verses, similar verses from Nicholas Notovich's book, that, from the manus Isa manuscript in his book. And I think the conclusion to come away with is he actually just copied the verses from Nicholas Notovich's book into his book. Uh, there were two women who were said to have been shown three parchments from, by the head librarian at Hemis where he said that these speak of your Jesus being here. And I believe this is supposed to be a picture that was taken there, but you cannot read what's on this parchment he's holding. And the two women could not read Tibetan. So we have no idea really what was being shown to them. And if you watch my earlier video, um, the monks could have had other motives for wanting people to believe that Jesus had been there. But there are, were also a number of other people who were actually told about the existence of these manuscripts, but they did not actually see them. So I don't know who Ed Martin is referring to about these so many other witnesses. He then goes on to say that, um, well, Jesus respected the teachings of both the Buddhist and the Hindus, but he fails to mention what's written in the Isa manuscript in chapter 5 that's recorded about Jesus where it said that Jesus disregarding their words remained with the Shudras preaching against the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas so it's talking about he's, Isa was disregarding the words of the Brahmins and Kshatriyas to not uh, talk or hang out with these Shudras and there's four groups in the Hindu caste system with the Brahmins or the priestly caste at the top, followed by the Kshatriyas or the warriors. The ruling, ruling class, below them are the Vaishyas, the merchants and shopkeepers, and then the Shudras are at the bottom. They're the servants to these three top uh, groups. But Isa was spending the majority of his time with the Shudras and the Brahmins and Kshatriyas did not like that. It said that Isa denied the divine inspiration of the Vedas and the, Hin and the Puranas, which are two Hindu scriptures, with the Vedas being uh, the oldest and some of the most revered by the Hindus. But uh, Isa manuscript is recorded as saying that Isa denied their divine inspiration. It's also recorded as saying Isa denied the Trimurti, or the Hindu trinity, which consists of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, and the incarnation of Pada Brahma and Vishnu Shiva and other gods. He also have, is recorded as having said, Pray not to idols, for they cannot hear you, speaking to the Hindus. Hearken not to the Vedas, where the truth is altered. So he's saying that there's no truth in the Vedas, because the truth in them has been changed or altered. Hmm. So if you're a Hindu and believe Jesus went to India, well, seems like this is the last document you should be trying to reference as uh, evidence that he was actually there. Or you're going to try to say that, well, what's recorded in these verses isn't true, but then that's going to call into question, well, what else in the this Isa manuscript is not true as well? Are you just picking and choosing what confirms your bias? And Ed Martin uh, also talks to the head Hindu priest at the Manakshi temple and the priest said that he believes Jesus was crucified and if you read a number of books on this subject I guess there's people who believe Jesus was crucified and died or and some believe that uh, he was crucified but ended up surviving but if you read what's in the uh, Quran Surah chapter 4 verse 157 it says something different than the Hindu priest 
It says, talking about the Jews, the Jews said, We have killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of God. The Quran goes on to say, They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. Though it was made to appear like that to them. Those that disagreed about him were full of doubt, with no knowledge to follow, only supposition. They certainly did not kill him. So here you have the Quran contradicting what the Hindu priest said or the Hindu priest contradicting what the Quran says about whether Jesus was actually crucified or not crucified. So Ed Martin goes on to try to talk to this Father Baptiste about Jesus being in India, and the Father Baptiste says, I've heard that Jesus was in Kashmir. I still believe it to be just a rumor without any historicity or any proof. And Martin replies, well, where there's a rumor, there's a little bit of truth, but... I'm not sure where he's getting his logic from because there could be no truth in a rumor. And I think he's falling prey to what a number of people are, which is this confirmation bias. It's a phenomenon wherein decision makers have been shown to actively seek out and assign more weight to evidence that confirms their hypothesis and ignore or underway evidence that could disconfirm it. So in a book titled Legitimating New Religions, Mr. James R. Lewis, I think, kind of sums up the thoughts well of people like Mr. Martin and others who want this tale of Jesus in India to be true. And he says, each successive person who perpetuated the Issa tradition was attracted to the legend for the same reason. The Indian Jesus could be deployed to legitimate their own brand of spirituality as well as to undermine the legitimacy of the dominant Christian tradition. And I think that's a very astute and um, good observation of what's going on. Because a number of people and religions want to co-opt Jesus into their fold and claim him as a guru or enlightened teacher and extract him from Christianity to legitimate their own brand of spirituality. And this seems to fit well with what Ed Martin is doing. Because in the video, he's grew up in a strict Church of Christ denomination, became disillusioned with the Christian faith. It seemed like basically because uh, his Bible study teachers and others couldn't answer his question about what happened to Jesus during these so-called missing years and probably other questions as well. And He also talked about uh, being an English teacher for a long number of years. I think he was in the Peace Corps and visited, I think it said Kashmir, in a place he had learned about Jesus actually being in Kashmir. So I think that started fueling his thoughts of this other uh, brand of spirituality that would, uh, if this was true and he could prove it, would basically undermine the legitimacy of Christianity, which he became disillusioned with uh, through his teen years and later. But we can see this confirmation bias in a book I came across by a man named Alexander Faber Kaiser titled Jesus Died in Kashmir. So I guess his, the hypothesis of his whole book is that Jesus survived the crucifixion, uh, escaped uh, from Israel, eventually went to Kashmir, settled there, lived a long life, and died, and is buried in a tomb there in Kashmir. But he cites this Isa manuscript as evidence, you know, pointing to that, yes, Jesus did go to India and studied and became enlightened. But he also cites a letter of Pilate that supposedly he wrote to Tiberius Caesar. And in the book he's using that because in this letter to, Pi oh, to Tiberius Caesar, it portrays Pilate as a sympathizer of Jesus. So in his book he also goes on to say that this original letter is actually preserved in the Vatican Library in Rome and it's possible to acquire copies of it at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., but from what I could research, and I found a letter from the Library of Congress to someone who had asked about it, they denied that they even have a copy of this letter of Pontius Pilate to Tiberius Caesar in their archives. So it appears like Mr. Faber Kaiser may be telling you something that's not true. And from other research on this letter, it's a Gnostic writing that doesn't seem to have much credibility. <clears throat> And the other thing about it is that the Isa manuscript and this letter of Pilate to Tiberius Caesar, they contradict each other. 
And so he's using this letter because, as I said, it portrays Pilate as a Jesus sympathizer, and it, it's the Jewish religious leaders who want Jesus crucified, and Pilate is the one who claims he's innocent of the death of Jesus, or of the just man Jesus. And he says in his book that Pilate's only option was to carry out the execution or crucifixion. I guess he felt he had no choice, but he was going to manipulate it in such a way that Jesus might survive being crucified. And unknown to his enemies, he, Pilate, arranged the crucifixion of Jesus for shortly before the commencement of the Jewish Sabbath. But if you read the Isa manuscript, it says just the opposite, that Pilate is the one who wants Jesus crucified, not the Jewish religious leaders. And it's the Jewish religious leaders who claim they are innocent of the death of a just man, Jesus. <clears throat> so Mr. Faber-Kaiser says, that what the Tibetan manuscript offers to this point is a logical explanation of Jesus' activities during his adolescence and early manhood, of which the Bible says absolutely nothing. So he believes the account in the Isa manuscript about Jesus going to India, studying with the Hindu gurus and Tibetan uh, Buddhist monks, but I'm sure he would deny this part in the manuscript that says Pilate is the one who wants Jesus crucified. But that brings up the question, well, what parts of this manuscript are true in what are not true, and it contradicts this letter to Pilate, so what in this letter to Pilate is true and what is not true? You know, he also makes some other <clears throat> discrepant statements in his book, even talking about crucifixion. Mr. Faber-Kaiser says that death eventually came through hunger and thirst, the inclemencies of the weather, attacks by birds of prey or other beasts. He says that Jesus and the thieves were taken down from their crosses at the same time, the thieves were still then alive, thus seeing that they suffered the same torture as Jesus. Hmm. It seems unlikely that Jesus was then already dead. But everything I've read about crucifixion says that a person dies by asphyxiation because eventually they're unable to lift their body up to open up their rib, rib cage to breathe, so they basically suffocate. Some other medical reports that I read state that heart failure can also occur, not basically succumbing because of hunger, lack of hunger and thirst. But also, how does Mr. Faber Kaiser know the two thieves suffered the same torture as Jesus? If we read the Isa manuscript that he uh, cites and spends about eight or nine pages talking about the uh, travels of Nicol Nicholas Notovich in. Uh, the Ladakh region and about this manuscript that he used to support the claim that Jesus was in India, it says this about Jesus. Soldiers were then sent to arrest him, Jesus, and he was cast into a dungeon where he was made to suffer various tortures that he might be forced to accuse himself. The servants of Pilate continued to torture him and reduced him to a state of extreme weakness. So this was even before the official Roman trial before Pilate, where Jesus would have been brought uh, for sentencing, and then uh, he would have been actually scourged by the Romans after he'd gone through this torture and ordeal. And so he, not Mr. Faber Kaiser, offers no evidence that the two thieves went through anything similar. But he does, does try to point to a verse in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23 where it uh, shows the two thieves being crucified with Jesus. They're all on the cross, and one of the thieves says to the other one, after one of them mocks Jesus, he says to the other thief, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? The only reason Mr. Faber-Kaiser would be pointing to this is that he's trying to show that they have under the same condemnation or torture, but... The verse only says the two thieves suffered the same condemnation of crucifixion as Jesus. It says nothing about torture. And the context of the verse is the two thieves and Jesus are already on their own crosses being crucified. So Mr. Faber-Kaiser's bias seems to drive him to ignore obvious contradictions between the Isa manuscript, letter of Pilate in the New Testament, and is picking and choosing what he wants in order to confirm his theory, as well as misinterpreting verses out of the New Testament. So also in the video, they uh, talk to a member of this ISKCON group, International Society of Krishna Consciousness, or the Hare Krishnas, where he says that for 12 years Jesus was at Jagannath Puri. There's a temple there in Jagannath Puri. 
So during my research, I came across a uh, this Hari Krishna newsletter, the Sri Krishna Kathamrita Bindu, where they talk about uh, Jesus being at this Jagannath temple. And this is what it says. It says, there's a local tradition here in Odisha that speaks about Christ's visit to Puri. This account seems to be based on an edition of a history book of the Jagannath Mandir in Puri called the Mata Apanji Drum Chronicle. In general, scholars and learned sadhus are dubious of the authenticity of at least some of the accounts in it. So you, here you have a uh, Hindu sect basically uh, saying, well, yeah, there may be some uh, history book or document at the Jagannath Puri temple, but uh, a number of scholars and learned sadhus are dubious of the authenticity of some parts of that. So you better be uh, skeptical about it. But even if this document does say that Jesus was there, there's no way to confirm the validity of what is written, or maybe it was just simply myth and legend about Jesus being there. There's no way to confirm that. They interview a spokesman from the Vatican, the Catholic Church, where he does not recognize Jesus being in India, but that's the obvious conclusion an unbiased person would have reached based on the evidence for Jesus being in India. So if you watch my earlier video, I go through a number of sources that are cited for Jesus actually being in India and compare that to the New Testament and looks at like how many manuscripts there are, when they were written, the time frame from when they were written to the copies or manuscripts that we have and is there really any credibility to this or not so that might be beneficial so then they talk to the uh, he talks Ed Martin talks to the Shankaracharya Charya at this Jagannath temple at Puri where he said that Jesus studied at the Jagannath temple but unfortunately the ancient records are hard to find because they were buried to protect them from invaders so you'll also here some excuse like this for the Issa manuscript that well either now the uh, Tibetan Buddhist monks can't find the manuscripts or they just don't want to show them to foreigners because they're afraid maybe they may steal them but in the past they did show them to some foreigners but not others and they showed them to Nicholas Nodovich because he had such skill and diplomacy that they uh, were comfortable with him and showed him the manuscripts but didn't show other people the manuscripts but I think that's all excuses and then the Shankaracharya mentions a Purana called this Bhavisha Purana so there's um, 36 Hindu Puranas there's 18 major ones which is the Bhavisha Purana is one of the 18 major ones and 18 minor Puranas that, so this Purana speaks of a king Shalivahan who's recorded as meeting Jesus while he's traveling there in Kashmir. But this Purana is not a credible document. I talked about that in my earlier video. Just go through some of the evidence here. But Alan Jacobs wrote about this in his book, When Jesus Lived in India. He said this Purana is believed to have been written sometime between the 3rd and 7th centuries AD. And it's also uh, important to know that this Bhavisha Purana is supposed to be like a foretelling of the future, so it's like a prophetic document that's supposed to be a foretelling of Jesus actually meeting this king in Kashmir at a later date. But he says that um, they was believed to have been written between the 3rd and 7th centuries A.D., so quite a long time after Jesus lived. But Dr. This hot Dr. Hosnane believes it may have been actually written in A.D. 125. And Mr. Jacobs goes on to say in his book, to this extent we may regard his evidence as possibly unreliable, as this addition to the main Quranic corpus may have been made to substantiate the whole case for Jesus having been actually in India well after the actual date. So again, we are in the realm of supposition. And a man by the name of Stephen Knapp also talks about this Purana, and he's a uh, follower of Hind the Hindu religion, he's written a number of books on uh, the subject, so he's not a biased uh, writer. And this is what he says about this Purana, that uh, the prophecy of Jesus in this Purana is found in no other Puranas, which often corroborate each other. So to find this story of Isha Messiah in no other Purana sends a red flag of warning. There are presently four known editions of the Barisha Purana, each having different predictions from the other. So they're not even consistent. But suspiciously, having one consistent prediction, that of Jesus or Isha Messiah, 
One edition contains five chapters, another four, it says another three, and yet another only has two chapters in it. Additionally, the contents in all four editions differ in various degrees, some having extra verses, some having less. So due to these circumstances, it is difficult to ascertain which of the four is the original text, if indeed an original text still exists. And he goes on to say that since none of the four editions of the Purana predate British rule in India, hmm, around 1850, this further suggests a discrepancy. He goes on to say, for example, at the very outset of this description of Jesus meeting Shalivahana, this section is fraught with historical inaccuracies. For years here you have a uh, proponent of Hin Hinduism in this Eastern worldview. I can't remember if he believes Jesus was in India or not. I think he does, but he's saying, well, you can't use this document as any kind of uh, credible evidence for that. And then later, they talk to an Ahmadiyya Muslim, Mr. Alif Khan, who actually cites the Bhavishya Purana as talking of Jesus being in India and Kashmir. So after what I've just shown up here, Mr. Khalik Khan is citing uh, this really source that has no credibility. Ed Martin states that Jesus criticized the caste system in Brahmins. I think we uh, I showed that a little bit earlier and that they were going to send out assassins to kill him. But then he was told by the Shudras what was up, so he was able to flee to Tibet. But again, Ed Martin doesn't mention that Jesus also criticized the Hindu religion and their scriptures, where he denied the inspiration of the Vedas and Puranas, denied the Hindu tri Trimurti, their trinity, told the Hindus not to pray to idols, for they cannot hear you, and said, hearken not to the Vedas, where the, your truth has been altered. And so if you read uh, or hear anything about the Vedas, they're sacred texts by the Hindus considered Shruti, which would mean that they were heard, so they weren't written down and recorded by man, they were just uh, heard by these uh, holy rishis. And so Jesus is saying, hey, the truth in these Vedas, they've been altered, so hearken not to them. So that's a pretty damning saying there. Ed Martin then admits that the Hemis manuscript may not be 2,000 years old, but more modern. He also said he doesn't know the facts of its true history. Hmm. I have no, no uh, disagreement there, since uh, we have no uh, document to examine, unlike the New Testament manuscripts. Um, we have no idea when actually this Hemis manuscript could have been written. And Martin goes on to say that he uh, tried to set up a meeting with the Dalai Lama to talk further about this, but he wasn't able to and received a type response, some type of correspondence from the Dalai Lama's secretary, basically stating that the Dalai Lama does not know of the existence of ancient Buddhist documents about Jesus having visited Tibet. And the Dalai Lama has always replied the same way to inquiries. So here's uh, some more rejection that the Dalai Lama saying through his secretary, I know of no existence of a Buddhist document that talks about Jesus having visited Tibet. But I'm sure you'll hear people will most likely say, well, this is, they're just lying because uh, the Dalai Lama is such a respectable man. He knows if he releases these documents, it's going to be uh, basically an insult to the uh, Christian church. So he doesn't want to release them or something to that effect. Then they go on to talk and interview a Professor James Deerdorf, which I believe he has a PhD in meteorology. He said, well, Islam believes Jesus didn't die on the cross. This is heresy to the Christians, but Jesus surviving the crucifixion has a lot of support. Hmm. Then they go interview back to Mr. Aleph Khan, this Ahmadiyya Muslim, who also talks about Jesus surviving the crucifixion because he only appeared to be dead, and think this is the swoon theory, and that if God allowed Jesus to die, he would have been a failed messiah. So this this Ahmadiyya sect of Islam, uh, from what I've been able to research, they're considered basically a cult, not given any credibility by the Shia and Sunni the larger sects of Islam, but they're the ones that are the most pronounced about actually believing that uh, Jesus survived the crucifixion. Uh, he's buried in a tomb in Kashmir. 
And so just some of the theories about Jesus surviving the crucifixion have been proven wanting and uh, really not credible. But this swoon theory says that Jesus, you know, went through all this the torture, crucifixion, and just uh, appeared that he was dead. The Romans who were basically uh, killing machines failed to notice that Jesus was still alive. And after he was taken down from the cross, wrapped in uh, linen, had the herbs and aloe applied to him, which had some healing properties. He was able to actually recover. As Mr. Faber Kaiser said in his book, now Jesus was able to roll this large stone away from the entr entrance of the tomb and somehow escape and flee to uh, Kashmir. And there's other theories that the disciples stole the body, hallucination theory, wrong tomb theory. A substitute took Jesus' place on the cross. This is what they read in, in the uh, verse from the Quran earlier, but these other theories really have no um, credibility. They also go on to talk about Dr. Ramesh Bajpai, who basically says, he says that if you nail a person through the palms and the legs and put them on a cross, the bleeding will be slow, you know, from these wounds and the palms and legs, and so they can actually be sustained for hours and so thus Jesus could have survived the crucifixion but it's interesting Dr. Bajpai didn't mention anything about the scourging Jesus is recorded to have gone through prior to his crucifixion which would have contributed to blood loss in the Romans the way they scourged with their whip from what I've been able to research they had pieces of bone and other other things at the end which would basically uh, tear into and rip pieces of your flesh out as they would pull it away. And he also didn't mention what um, the Issa manuscript said that even prior to the Roman trial and Roman scourging, that Pilate had him thrown in, uh, into prison and was tortured, where he was brought to a state of extreme weakness even before he was crucified. But none of this is mentioned. Ed Martin talks about similarities between the Hebrews and the people of Kashmir, but this really isn't unusual because I think it could be easily explained by the ten lost tribes of Israel who had followed the Silk Road after they were taken into exile by the Assyrians, I believe in 720 BC, this, these ten lost northern tribes of Israel, and then they just settled in areas along the Silk Road route in uh, blended in with the populations there, assimilated. So even if, in a, from other research I've done, I believe they have found that certain number of these people groups have similar DNA to those of the actual ancient Hebrews and similar customs. But even uh, saying all that, that this says nothing about Jesus actually being buried there in a tomb in Kashmir, or actually having been there. And interesting, some people actually believe Jesus is buried in Shingo, Japan. And if you research the Shinto religion, it has some strikingly similar parallels to that of ancient Israel. So I've done some research into the subject, and a good book to read on this is The Biblical Hebrew Origin of the Japanese People by Joseph Eidelberg. And there's also a Japanese pastor by the name of Arimasa Kubo who's done some, a lot of research into this as well. And just one of the interesting things the uh, ancient Israelites had the uh, Ark of the Covenant you know, the box that they would carry with poles on their shoulders and the uh, Shinto religion has something eerily similar called a Mikoshi where they can put in uh, remnants of their kami or god and they carry those around also on poles on their shoulders I believe that's the only other religion that has something similar so it makes you wonder how did they get uh, such a similar uh, item that um, looks eerily similar to the Ark of the Covenant that the ancient Israelites had. And um, here's just a sign from the roadway. It says, Cristo no Hako. If I remember my Chinese uh, Japanese characters. Talking about the Tomb of Christ that you can actually go visit in Shingo, Japan. The video also uh, interviews Elaine Pagels, who references the Gospel of Thomas several times and she's done a number of a lot of research on the uh, Nag Hammadi uh, books and the Gnostic Gospels but one needs to first establish the credibility and reliability of this Gospel over the New Testament Gospels and Dr. Craig Blomberg says the following about the Gospel of Thomas that 
It's a collection of 114 sayings attributed to Jesus. They were allegedly revealed in secret to the Apostle Thomas, but no serious scholar believes his claim. Many of the sayings have a patently Gnostic flavor, and little can be said in support of their authenticity. And he goes on to cite like the 114th saying that's in here that says this, Simon Peter said to them, Make Mary leave us, for females don't deserve life. Jesus said, Look, I will guide her to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit, resembling you males, for every female who makes herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, these are some chauvinistic and misogynistic sayings by Simon Peter and Jesus. And if you read uh, a number of these 114 sayings, it appear to be almost exactly the same or slightly changed from sayings of Jesus in the New Testament Gospels. So it brings up a question, well, what is the dating on this Gospel of Thomas? And Bart Ehrman has a uh, blog where he talks about this. Someone asked him this specific question. He says, Professor, what is your view? Do you believe the Gospel of Thomas predates the synoptic, synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or at least John? Bart Ehrman replies, no, I don't think so. So if this Gospel of Thomas has uh, sayings that are basically almost the same as those from the New Testament Gospels, you have to infer that they were copied because the New Testament Gospels are earlier. They go on to talk, uh, interview another uh, Self-Realization Fellowship spokesman who tries to spiritualize Jesus' teaching and quotes Luke 17, verse 21, where Jesus says, The kingdom of God is within you. And I've also seen this quoted by his power of Mahansa Yogananda and another number of other uh, Hindu writers uh, trying to co-opt Jesus into their fold and making him seem like this enlightened guru. And so various uh, translations do render the Greek of Luke 721 various ways. Uh, it was the King James and New King James version translates it as the kingdom of God is within you. But then other ver versions say the kingdom of God is among you, or in your midst, or in the midst of you. So there's an obvious difference between trying to say the kingdom of God is within you, or the kingdom of God is among you. So just in the context, within you comes off as an unfavorable translation, seeing that Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees at this time. So we need to not just look at this one verse in isolation, but the context where Jesus is actually saying the verse, he's talking to these Jewish religious leaders, the Pharisees, one of the sects of, of Judaism, and the Sadducees and the Essenes. But it says Jesus was surely not saying that the kingdom of God resided within the Pharisees' hearts, because if you know anything about the Pharisees, they opposed Jesus, had no relationship with God, and Jesus in other places denounced them as whitewashed tombs and hypocrites, speaking of the Pharisees. So a better translation would be to say the kingdom of God is, it would be in your midst, would be the kingdom of God is among you. And to further elaborate on that, Jesus was telling the Pharisees that he brought the kingdom of God to earth. So Jesus brought the kingdom of God to earth. And that Jesus' presence in their midst gave them a taste of the kingdom life. So it's, he's talking about Jesus' presence himself before these Pharisees as attested by the miracles that Jesus performed. Elsewhere, Jesus mentions his miracles as a definitive proof of the kingdom. He says, If I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So a much better translation is to say that the kingdom of God is among you. And that's referring to Jesus, who was among the Pharisees and the people at that time during his ministry. The video also goes on to interview Mr. Deerdorf again, where he says that legends have it that Jesus lived a long time in northern India and Kashmir and that he has a tomb there. But interesting, he uses the word legends have it. And that's really all it is, is legends, because there's no uh, definitive proof. And they also talk to Mr. Aleph Khan again, the Ahmadiyya Muslim, who also builds up that there's a tomb of Jesus in Kashmir, because that's one of the things main beliefs of the Ahmadiyya Muslims, as well as a lady named Susan Olson, who I believe she actually uh, has spent some time over there in Kashmir doing research on this tomb, and she says, I have no doubt within my heart that Jesus is in that tomb, but 
I guess her ardent, ardent belief that he's there in the tomb with no doubt in her heart doesn't prove that he's actually buried there. <clears throat> Stephen Knapp, the uh, Hindu follower of Hinduism, says this, However, when talking with local Muslims who live nearby, they will tell you adamantly that this is not the grave of Jesus, but it's the tomb of a Muslim prophet, Yuza. The locals will also tell you that the grave is that of a messenger of God who liked the Muslim people and settled there, but they do not think it was Jesus. So even among the local people, different versions of the story about the grave circulate. Also, some Muslims feel that in the end, after the crucifixion, Jesus was lifted up to heaven because if he had actually died on the cross, it would be a sign that he had failed his mission. So there's no credible evidence for Jesus being buried in Kashmir and as seen above, many Muslims in the area don't believe the claim themselves. And as I mentioned earlier, Ed Martin says toward the end of the video, well, we have come away with no closer proof that Jesus actually was in India. That's a, seems to be an honest, truthful statement by Mr. Martin. And they also uh, talked to a policeman in Jammu and Kashmir, and he said that the supposed tomb of Jesus there is actually the tomb of the prophet Yuza, and not Jesus. And they interview a Muslim man on the street in Kashmir about the tomb of Jesus, and he says, so if someone says that Jesus Christ is buried here, this is an insult to Muslims and to our holy Quran. So I think uh, based on the evidence for Jesus being in India, again watch my earlier video from, the, from some of the other sources that are cited, I think uh, if you look at this question and honestly consider it, so say you're on trial facing the death penalty and this is a type of evidence that's offered against you what people bring up about Jesus being in India you know the Isa manuscript that's written about by Nicholas Notovich and Swami Abhidananda a reference to Bhavisha Purana they've shown it really has no credibility they'll talk about this Nantha Namavali Sutra the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ and I go through some evidence for that in the early video but if say this is a type of evidence that's offered against you in trial when you're facing the death penalty and the jury comes back and basically says no we this isn't enough evidence we find the defendant not guilty you're going to jump up and say no it's really convincing convict me I'm guilty I think an honest person would have to answer no in this case but it seems like they're answering yes that they believe it but if if their death is on the line they would have to say no uh, it's not sufficient and credible evidence <laughs>